the false atmospherics of peace rather than genuine peace. We sit down to discuss America's failure to recognize the full extent of the threat of communist China and what should be done to counter it. The Chinese Communist Party is effectively like an organized criminal enterprise. The Chinese regime has killed somewhere between 60 million and 200 million of its own people. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Keller. John Lenchowski. Such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. It is my pleasure and honor to be here, John. Thank you. So, John, I read your article from earlier this year, Cold War Strategy for Genuine Peace with China. And in there, you have an astonishing list of various offensive actions that the Chinese regime has taken against America, against the West. Uh, and I didn't even know about some of these things, like, for example, Stinger missiles, an attempt to deliver Stinger missiles to gangs in L.A. Um, how is it that we don't know about these things? Well, there are many reasons, and particularly it is the failure of our national leadership to tell the American people the truth about these acts of aggression against us. Uh, there, there is willful blindness. There is wishful thinking. There is mirror imaging. There is corruption. Uh, there are all sorts of business interests who would prefer to try to do harmonious business with the Chinese communist regime, just the way there were businesses that wanted to make money by doing business with Russia uh, and, 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 and with Nazi Germany uh, before that, and before the Cold War, and I should say the Soviet Union. In any event, uh, there are... There has been self-censorship about these matters. The academic community and the media community uh, have been corrupted effectively by, uh, by the Chinese communist regime. Uh, academics have learned uh, to respect what I call the four taboos. Uh, don't, and, and, and journalists too, don't write about Chinese human rights violations, don't write about their military buildup, don't write about their espionage, and don't write about their politic, covert political influence operations, many of which have also are, are overt. And so if you don't write about those things, then you'll get a visa to China, and you can go to the country of your expertise, and your a New York Times bureau won't be shut down and you won't be expelled for writing things that are offensive to the Chinese communist regime. So there, there are many, many reasons for, for, for this. Although, John, if I can jump in, yes. I mean, all those things that you just described, they are covered somewhat today. I mean, the human I rights it, but... violations mm -hmm. to a better extent. Mm -hmm. But for years, the New York Times and the Washington Post most notably, we're taking millions of dollars uh, for, from the Chinese propaganda ministry uh, to publish Chinese communist propaganda in the periodic uh, China Watch supplement. Uh, and, and during that whole time, I don't know how much that supplement was influencing people. It was designed to give people the impression that China is a dynamic, a culturally rich, uh, you know, innovative country that's basically a normal society that uh, is, is a natural competitor to the United States. But it is designed basically to obscure the aggressive intent of the Chinese communist regime and, uh, and, and the acts of aggression that they have actually taken against us. And meanwhile, while they're accepting, all these newspapers are accepting all of this money from, from Beijing, they are not reporting about the, the, the matters in the four taboos, a little bit on human rights, because when both Republican and Democratic administrations declare that the communist regime is committing genocide against the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province, East Turkestan, the, you know, somebody has to write a little something about this, but almost nothing is being written about forced organ transplants, about forced abortions, about uh, the, the persecution of various different religious groups, and you would see nothing in the Washington
Washington Post and the New York Times about military and espionage activities in, that are inimical to the national security of the United States. The television networks follow their lead in terms of what is politically acceptable uh, to, to report. After this corruption, uh, the accepting of the Chinese money to publish uh, the, the Chinese communist propaganda was exposed. Uh, I don't think that they're publishing. I don't. I don't see now the, the China Watch supplement anymore. But those weren't the only papers. The Des Moines Register was 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 publishing this kind of stuff just for, as an example. And then look at the think tanks. The, the, something like a half a dozen, maybe it's seven or eight blue chip think tanks were accepting money from front organizations of Chinese intelligence and doing joint projects with them. We're talking about the Brookings Institution, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Carter Center, my own alma mater, which is Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. This is scandalous, absolutely scandalous. And, and some of these think tanks, like the Carnegie Endowment, were actually hiring Chinese intelligence operatives to work on their staff. This is interest. The academic institutions are addicted to Chinese students who pay full tuition. Many of these students are going into the STEM departments. Many of them already have the advanced degrees in engineering, for example, uh, that they are seeking in the American institutions. Why would they come and get a duplicate degree? Well, because they learned the basics in China, and now they know what the cutting edge research could be uh, that their professors are engaging in, all the easier to steal it and to report it to the Chinese MSS, their intelligence service. So there's, there's so many reasons why the American people don't know about it. But the biggest problem is that our national leadership that is privy to at least uh, to a lot of the intelligence about this is not reporting these facts to the American people. In, in contrast, take a look at Ronald Reagan and his administration. He was warning us about the, the Soviet military buildup throughout the 1970s. He was questioning the policy of detente, which is the equivalent of today's policy of engagement with the Chinese communist regime. In November 1982, Reagan gave a nationwide televised speech on the Soviet military threat and how uh, Soviet armaments were, were uh, growing and growing and growing while ours were declining. And, uh, and, and he helped build a pro-defense consensus in this country that ended up uh, having extremely salutary effects. Well, of course, you'd be very familiar with this whole thing because you worked on his National Security Council back in the day before you know, founding the Institute of World Politics. You know, you're describing, I guess you could say, kind of the overall state of affairs over the last, I don't know, what is it, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but things have changed significantly, at least in my eye, in the last eight, five, seven, eight years, something like that. Would you agree? Well, I think that what has changed is that uh, Xi Jinping has decided to take the gloves off in many respects. The grand strategist behind uh, China's rise uh, as a strategic peer and competitor of the United States was Deng Xiaoping, who uh, said, hide your capabilities and bide, we should hide our capabilities and bide our time. Uh, he was a master of the central strategic deception uh, exercised by the Chinese regime, which is the same thing as the, center, the central strategic deception theme of the Soviet Union, and that is, we are not communist anymore. We've changed, mm -hmm. and we're just a bunch of nice people, and we give you ping pong games, and we give you pandas, and, uh, and you can hug our pandas, and do harmonious business with us and make a lot of money and everybody will be happy. And <clears throat> during this whole time, uh, China has been <clears throat> building itself up, has been stealing our technology. The, the, the head of the National Security Agency recently, you know, a, a 
a recent head of it declared that the uh, intellectual property theft being committed by the Chinese intelligence services uh, and their students and their business, their friendly business delegations and everything else is the greatest theft of intellectual property in the history of the world. And, and it is at our expense, it is at the expense of our ability to be competitive economically in the world, and it is at the expense of our competitive edge in military and intelligence technology. We became convinced that the, the Chinese communist regime is not communist anymore. And, and of course, if they, have to, if, if they had actually changed as the strategic deception theme tells us, that means that by definition, they no longer have unlimited objectives on the global stage. <laughs> Accepting this the strategic deception theme is the same intellectual error as those in the 1930s who assumed that Hitler's uh, desire for Lebensraum, uh, more room for the German people was effectively no different than the Kaiser's imperial ambitions, which were limited. The Kaiser simply wanted Germany to uh, have its place in the sun, as they said, <clears throat> alongside the other great imperial powers of Europe. <clears throat> Why shouldn't Germany have an empire too? So if Hitler is no different than, uh, than, than the Kaiser, then perhaps, and if he has indeed limited objectives, well, perhaps those limited objectives can be accommodated, perhaps even appeased. When in fact, when if you are dealing with a voracious power, with a revolutionary, ideologically based uh, uh, ambition of, of, of unlimited objectives, then appeasement will only whet the appetite John, uh, just a quick sec. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. I I'm going to get you to, first of all, just explain to me. I mean, might it might seem obvious, but what exactly unlimited objectives means, and how can you know? This would, this would seem to be a, uh, a, a foundational question. Well, it is in the nature of the ideology of uh, Marxism-Leninism uh, as a vision of the inevitable victory of communism worldwide on the basis of the proletarian class struggle against the oppressor class. Now, uh, communist China has a, a variant of this. Um, they claim that their main ideology, and they reiterate this all the time, they just did it this summer at the plenum of the Communist Party. Their ideology is Marxism-Leninism with Chinese characteristics. They're emphasizing the importance of Mao Zedong thought and the importance of Xi Jinping thought. And so in, in the case of the Chinese, and I do not think that the, re the regime represents the people, I consider it to be the oppressor of the people. But the... Um, the regime uh, attempts to harness Chinese nationalism as a part of its global strategy. Um, the Soviets tried to do this too, from time to time. Uh, when they were threatened by Hitler, uh, and they had to embark on the great uh, fatherland war, Velikaya uh, and it, it wasn't the great class war, the great proletarian war, the great communist war. It was the great fatherland war. They had revised Russian history. They had thrown historic Russian heroes into the dustbin to destroy the national memory and to remake the national identity. Uh, but now they had to mobilize every force they possibly could in order to fight the Nazis. And so they rehabilitated those heroes, Alexander Nevsky and the others. And, 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 and they took
took the Russian Orthodox priests out of the gulag and said, you can go back to your churches because of the, 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 the close relationship between Russian Orthodox Christianity and the Russian national identity. Well, these people were all languishing in the slave labor camps if they were still alive. And, uh, but now they're mobilized in a great nationalistic war effort. And, and of course, you know, so many people in the foreign policy establishment, if you ask them what are Soviet objectives in, in the world and, you know, what, what is the foundation of Soviet foreign policy? Well, they say it's a combination of Marxism, Leninism, and Russian national interest, Russian nationalism. Well, excuse me, there may be such a combination, but which is the senior partner? Uh, in my book, the, the short answer to this is that it is a communist party operation that is attempting to harness the Russian national horse in its <laughs> plan. And, 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 and the Chinese communist regime is doing the exact same thing. They're trying to harness Chinese uh, national pride, the, re the rejuvenation of, of the Chinese nation, uh, the restoration of the Middle Kingdom, but ultimately they want to control and dominate the world, if possible make uh, all the rest of the world tributary states. Marxism-Leninism has defines a new form of international relations. It's called proletarian internationalism. You don't hear the Chinese communist regime using this expression very much because it was a Soviet expression. And they called it explicitly a new form of international relations. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that international relations are now not going to be, be conducted on a nation to nation basis because the nation actually is a dangerous thing. Uh, the the you know the, the nation state government is actually part of the system of oppression within a given country, and so that's why the state has to wither away, and will wither away according to the, the communist prophecies, and um, and so then how are relations conducted on a global basis amongst peoples? Uh, well, they're conducted on a party-to-party -party basis, because the party is the genuine representative of the people, you see. And so uh, how does China conduct its relations with North Korea, for example? Not through the foreign ministry, not through the instruments of the state. They conduct it on a party-to-party -party basis. So even though they don't use this expression, the Chinese communist regime is de facto pursuing a policy of pro proletarian internationalism. And you can extrapolate that to the rest of the world as part of Chinese ambitions. First, they'll have a system of tributary states. Then those state systems uh, are basically designed to evaporate. And, and things will be conducted on a party-to-party -party basis, which is the only way the Chinese regime can fully feel secure when it doesn't have normal nation states with self-determination, with consent of the governed, with an al alternative forms of legitimization of, the, uh, of state authority. The, you know, what is the legitimate, what is the legitimizing instrument of state authority in China? It's Marxism, Leninism with Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. Many people, including some very prominent Sinologists who even I have a deep respect for their work, would, would, will tell us, hey, um, most people in China <laughs> don't believe in communism anymore. It's something different. In, including party members. Correct. Well, no, no, exactly. Well, this is the this is the terrible failure of mirror imaging. Mirror imaging is the treacherous methodology of looking at other cultures as if they are just like us. And so, the assumption here 
by all sorts of people observing China, including such prominent and otherwise very sound thinking sinologists, is that you have to believe in an ideology for it to be politically operational. But this is not the case. This was not the case in the Soviet Union, and it is not the case in China. <laughs> and, and one has to study enough about ideology not only to know what its, you know, guiding principles are or constraining principles, uh, if you if you want to put it another from another perspective, but you have to understand what its functions are in the system, and in 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 China as it was in other communist countries, as it is in North Korea, the ideology serves two fundamental purposes. One is to legitimize the regime in power. You know, why does the party deserve to be in power? Well, it's the Marxist-Leninist ideology that supplies that for them. And it's, uh, I can explain that if you like, but that's their, that's their principal instrument. They have auxiliary instruments. They like to say, well, we are Chinese patriots who are building up the Chinese nation. Uh, they can say... Uh, you know, we are presiding over a growing economy and have brought millions of poor people. That, that's that's, that's well, entirely justice for the century of humiliation, right. for example. Yes, yes. and, and mm -hmm. nobody else could have done it. We were the ones who did it. You know, the Soviets had a similar thing. You know, we may be bastards, but we're your bastards. We were the only ones who could get rid of and, and, and fend off the Nazis. So the Chinese have a variant of, of all of this themselves. But so so legitimization, you know, or legitimation is, is the one is, is one essential function. But the other essential function is internal security. The 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 Chinese regime is an illegitimate regime. It rules without the consent of the governed, and so it has an internal security problem. It is afraid of it, they're, all, they're afraid of their own people. Well, John Lanchowski, it's such a pleasure to have had you on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. I don't often get the chance to talk about all of these things, so thank you. Thank you all for joining Dr. John Lanchowski and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Yanya Kellick.